we're up to 10 o'clock. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we have um, a couple of announcements over here. We currently have 28 people joining us, which is fabulous. And so one of the things I mentioned a few minutes ago is the fact that we have two other opportunities for um, educational outreach for um, stormwater workshop series. And you can see that um, our next one is scheduled for June 18th with preventative maintenance, irrigation management, water conservation practices. And then the 13th of August, um, we're looking at um, going into any problems you may occur during the season, but then so, you know, what to do as we go into the fall and winter months. So before we leave or when you have an opportunity, if you would like to type in something, if, if irrigation management or maybe wildlife management is a big part of that, um, invasive species management things that you um, are having issues with or would like to learn more about, that's a hot topic for you. Please type that in the chat box for us and um, so we can help uh, and we'll prioritize. For those of you who are on for new management credits, um, we may go um, for 90 minutes and with that you will also get one credits um, towards your recertification credits. And the hey, last... Freddie? Yes. Can you can you ask people to mute their um because I don't think everyone's muted and I'm hearing some background noise. Okay, we'll double check that. I'll mute I'll mute everybody. Yeah. So the last and final announcement right now is a reminder that if you have questions, please type those in the chat box. Um, Blake Moore is going to help monitor that for us, and um, we um, ask that at the end. I'm sure Sue will hang on for a few minutes for any questions that you can unmute, ask a question, and then return to mute um, for us. That would be great. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Sue Barton. Sue um, is our ornamental specialist and professor in the plant science department at the University of Delaware. I've had the pleasure of working with her for quite a while now, and she's a wonderful resource for us, has done a, a great job um, helping um, develop a, a livable Delaware series where it involves invasive species, it involves different landscape scenarios, dry shade, you know, near the, the uh, ocean where you need salt tolerance, things like that. So a lot of wonderful resources we have. And Sue's going to talk to us about open space management, which I know is a big factor for a lot of us here in Sussex, whether you're in an urban setting or even um, in the agricultural setting. Um, very important as we help maintain these areas and do what we can to, for water quality. So with that, Sue, I'm going to let you go ahead and take over. Okay, great. Is, um, Tracy, is my screen shared now so you can see my slides? Yes, it is. Okay, mm -hmm. great. All right, so let's get rolling. Um, I'm going to start right in with this image. And um, for a number of years, I have given a talk uh, during the St. Mark's High School career day in June. And uh, I was representing the career of landscaping or sustainable landscaping in particular. And I would show this slide as sort of, you know, an example of what I thought was a good sustainable landscape. And I realized, um, and, and then I would show this next slide as sort of the negative slide, the non-sustainable landscape. And, you know, watching people's body language, I realized pretty quickly that um, the students, or many of them, actually liked what I considered the bad slide better than the good slide. So, I, I stopped and I asked everyone to vote for which image they liked better, you know, the, what I thought was a sustainable landscape or what I thought was an unsustainable landscape. And it, it turns out that at least half the class liked this image better, like this landscape better, including the teacher. And so I really had to sort of stop and think and regroup and, and you know, imagine why and um, if, if we were doing this live, I would be asking you all why. And if you want, why don't you type into the chat box why you think people like this landscape better? And then Blake can tell us what people have said. So 
What do you think the reasons are that people like this landscape better? You got curb appeal. It looks cleaner, cleaner, smaller, neater, neat. Yeah, I think uh, all of those are correct. Um, neat and tidy is sort of the buzzword for this landscape. And also, it's familiar. You know, it is what most landscapes look like. So it, it's, you know, it's what is familiar to people. So it's not that surprising, once you think about it, that this is you know, the more popular landscape among high school students and, and among many people. But we need to sort of reframe how we think about the suburban landscape if we want to provide the ecosystem services that we all need to survive. And so that's what I'm talking going to be talking about today, something other than this huge area of mowed lawn. I am not opposed to lawn. Lawn provides an important play area. It, it, it provides circulation in the landscape. It's that nice green carpet that connects all of the rest of the plantings, but it doesn't need to be this big. I mean, there is you know, no reason to have a lawn this huge unless you wanna have like two football games going on at the same time. Um, so we came to this sort of love of the lawn in the US um, you know, honestly, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, who was the landscape architect who designed uh, Central Park in New York City, has this quote in a book called Crabgrass Frontier. He says, probably the advantages of civilization can be found illustrated and demonstrated under no other circumstances so completely as in some suburban neighborhoods where each family abode stands 50 or 100 feet or more apart from all others and at some distance from the public road. And what he doesn't actually say, but what he's implying is that that, that public space is a lawn. And that is what we have done. We've had these isolated individual homes that are surrounded by lawns. And we've been doing that for a number of years and, and that's what we're all very used to. But this is a graphic that Doug Tallamy uses in his lectures. Um, Doug Tallamy is an, entom an, an entomologist here at UD who's written a number of books um, and uh, about uh, insects and their relationship to native plants and then uh, sort of a new landscaping paradigm that provides the ecosystem services that we need and supports the insects and on up the food chain. And he says, you know, we used to landscape primarily based on decorative value. Is the plant providing a screen, a focal point, an anchor? And now we really need to balance that with the environmental benefits that we're getting out of plants in our landscape. Does it provide food web value, pollinator habitat, restore the soil, sequester carbon, moderate weather and, and uh, improve water quality and water quantity issues. So that doesn't mean we have to throw out the aesthetics, and I'll be talking about that today quite a bit, but we have to balance that with these environmental benefits that we can get out of our landscaping if we do it properly. So I'm gonna focus on a couple of things, components of landscape, and I'm gonna talk about them as they're applied in sort of the individual suburban home setting, as well as in a community setting or a larger open space setting. So meadows are one type of landscape that is different from that typical mowed lawn. They definitely provide better water management. If you can imagine this slope, if it were mowed, water would just sheet down that slope, but because it's got this taller grass meadow, water is slowed down and it's allowed to infiltrate much better. Um, meadows reduce nutrient pollution, again, because of slowing the water down, they support more wildlife, they save time and energy. If you're not out here mowing this slope every week, you're saving time and energy. And I would say when they're managed, like this, they actually look 
more attractive than that slope would look if it if it were mowed. Another type of of landscape is a bioretention facility. We'll talk about those. Um, so this is a um, development in northern uh, Wilmington, well, in the Centerville area, that has um, these bioretention facilities instead of a lot of stormwater pipes. Um, so they're managing water in this more sustainable way, improving water infiltration, reducing standing water, cleaning the water before it enters um, the uh, surface body of water like a stream or a pond or a lake, reduces erosion and again supports more wildlife. Another option is to have a forest or a woodland and these can be small forest fragments. They improve air quality because leaves intercept particulates and pull other pollutants out of the air. So if you think about a lawn that is you know taking in carbon dioxide and giving off oxygen, but it's only doing it in a very small area. A forest has all different levels of landscape from the ground layer to the shrub layer to the tree layer, and that is intercepting a lot more air pollution and improving air quality much more than a, a simple lawn would. Um, the plant layers also reduce erosion because when it rains, the rain hits a number of different leaves before it falls to the ground. And so the force of the rain is much less in a forest than it would be just in an open lawn area. And again, this type of landscape supports more wildlife. So we're gonna start with meadows. Meadows are sort of the thing that people might have the most resistance to. Um, so here is an example where I think this landscape would benefit from a very small meadow. This is actually um, a property that I drive by every day on a street near my home. And these pines, like lots of white pines, have been limbed up because that's what happens when pines age. And so what used to be a great screen for this home here now isn't really a screen at all. It, it looks kind of funny. And I would say if this, and it's a pain in the neck to mow, they have to mow around all of these individual white pines and spruce. If they had put a big bed around these plants and allowed it to be something like a warm season grass, like switchgrass, which would look sort of like a meadow, they would get so much more screening from this relatively big road um, and their backyard would be so much more pleasant. And if you can kind of imagine, it might look something like this. This is a park in Lewis, uh, but it was designed by Andrew Pogon, a firm in Philadelphia that's really known for sustainable landscaping. So it's the same sort of concept, tall trees with this switchgrass around the base. And just sort of for a second, imagine what this would look like if it had that switchgrass meadow around the base of it. I think it would be a huge improvement. Here's a big open space. This is a development out 896. Um, it's in Pennsylvania, just over the border between Pennsylvania and Delaware. And the, the builder had to leave this open tract of land. The same amount of space that was built on is left as open space for the, for the community. Um, and he could have just left this um, as mowed lawn, which would have been a, a terrible drain on community resources because you would have had to mow it regularly. Instead, they planted trees. They were really small seedlings initially. And then they sowed a meadow um, all in that area and that has become they've mowed paths through it and this is key i'm going to be coming back to this um quite a bit throughout this talk this concept of mowing a path through your meadow and how that makes the meadow accessible it makes it look purposeful so um this area has paths all through it and people in the community really use this space for walking their dog, taking a walk themselves. It's large enough that, that you can even go on a run in this um, area of the community. 
So how do you get a meta? What is the process? Well, clearly the simplest is to just let the existing grass grow tall and form a meadow. Now, depending upon your seed source, your conditions, the types of um, plants that are nearby, you may or may not get a desirable meadow. This is an area on the roadside that we, we had Del Dot Stop mow, mow and um, what came in was little blue stem. This sort of darker, taller grass is little blue stem, which is actually quite beautiful. It came in on its own. And this is what blue stem looks like in the winter. It gets this kind of apricot color and it's you know quite attractive as as a meadow grass so sometimes depending on the conditions you may be able to do nothing stop mowing and you'll get something beautiful like um little blue stem other times you might want to sort of up the ante and seed a meadow this is a roadside meadow that we seeded and initially it had lots of rudbeckia herba in it which is um a, an annual or sometimes considered a short-lived perennial um, and it has to reseed every year or every couple of years. So initially you'll have a lot of it in the meadow, but as other plants start to fill in, there's less open soil space for that seed to germinate. And so this, um, this uh, Rudbeckia or Black-Eyed Susan will eventually remove itself from the meadow and the meadow will become much more of a grass dominated meadow. So it's very, very difficult to keep a florific meadow that's flowering, you know, throughout the season, um, that that is not a really sustainable type of meadow. So if you're thinking of meadow, you should be thinking more about beautiful grasses that blow in the wind, that are more sustainable long term in in the meadow. Here's a small meadow in a home landscape, so meadows don't have to be huge. This is on the corner of a backyard. There's a path put in. There's a circular area, kind of a gathering space you could share. Yeah, we're we're getting something going on where you're getting a little bit of feedback on your microphone. Um, mm -hmm. Not really sure why. Uh, sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's not. It might be the okay. internet connection. I mean, I'm at UD, so I don't I don't know what else I can do. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe if I'm a little quieter. Uh, tell, let me know if it gets bad again. Okay. Sure. Okay. So this is a, um, a small meadow that was sown in the corner of a home landscape. It's uh, dominated by Indian grass, which is a nice native warm season grass, but there are some flowers that are in there as well. Here's a different meadow. This is a roadside meadow. It's Mixed. It's got Indian grass, but it's got lots of other species in there as well. Um, this is a plug meadow. So this is another option if you have a small area and you really want to have a lot of flowering plants in your meadow, you can use plugs to establish a meadow. This was done at North Creek Nurseries a long time ago. This is probably 20, maybe even 25 years old. This meadow, they have some switchgrass, they have some asters, they have some goldenrod, they have some uh, sylvia or cup plant, and to control where those plants are, are planted because they planted them from plugs. But you couldn't use plugs for a large meadow because it would be cost prohibitive. One of the things I wanna caution you about in starting a meadow. This was at AstraZeneca. This was a number of years ago. And um, a landscape firm was responsible for managing this property. And AstraZeneca wanted to have a larger area of the meadow. And this is what was seated. It's a prominent part. You can see it's all glass. So lots of people saw this meadow. And it was dominated by 
annuals and particularly non-native annuals. Purple and pink like that you see is cosmos, which is quite pretty. Uh, this meadow was stunning the first year. It was a sea of flowers. People loved it, but then they were disappointed when in future years, there is no way that they could keep up this level of flowering. Weeds started to come in because there really wasn't enough of a grass backbone to sustain this meadow. So when you establish a meadow, it's important that people have a realistic expectation for what the meadow is going to be. So let's talk about the process. So this is a, a roadside meadow that we um, experimented with years ago um, near Milton, Milford. And um, this line that I'm showing here shows that on the left side of this line, we treated the area with glyphosate. We killed all the existing vegetation. On the right side of the line, we mowed the vegetation short but we didn't kill any existing vegetation. Then we seeded the whole thing with our seed mix that included um, both uh, herbaceous forbs, flowering plants, as well as grasses. And this photograph was taken about three years after the seeding. And what you're seeing is on the left side here, lots of warm season grass, the stuff that we seeded has come in, on the right side, you're seeing almost all the same cool season grass that used to be there. And what that tells us is that because we didn't kill that existing cool season grass, it was too vigorous and it didn't allow the warm season grass to get established. Um, eventually, the warm season grass might be able to take over that area, and, and it has now, 15 years later, but for a long time, that cool season grass is not going to allow the seed that was, German, that was sown there to germinate. So we learned in several different trials that it's very important to get rid of your existing vegetation. So that's step one. And that was what was done in this um, home meadow. Um, the existing grass was killed in this case with glyphosate, but the path in, the circular gathering space and the path out was maintained. Now, there are a couple of different options for how you might seed. Um, you could hydro seed, I'll talk about that in a minute. You could seed with a drill, or you could use this broadcast in sawdust method, which is my favorite, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Hydro seeding is useful if you can't, if you don't really have good access to the terrain. So your truck can be up here on the road or the flat area, and you can seed a slope by spraying the seed and paper pulp out with water. This is how lawns are seeded a lot. Um, and, but when you're seeding a meadow, you really have to use a two-step process. If you try to spray the paper pulp, the water, and the meadow seed out all at one time, that meadow seed is, is uh, all different sizes and it will tend, the paper will dry and it will pull the seed away from the soil and then you don't get good seed soil contact and your meadow seed won't germinate. So what you need to do is spray the seed and the water out first and then you spray the paper pulp on top of that if you're seeding a meadow. When we seeded this meadow, we did, uh, or not this one, but we have done others where we did half hydro seeding, half drill seeding, and the drill seeding was definitely better at first, but the hydro seeding caught up eventually. So it is a viable alternative. Drill seeding is where you actually take the seed, you use a drill, you make a little hole in the soil with a disc, and you deposit the seed in that hole. You get very good seed soil contact, and there's a particular kind of drill called a true axe drill, which is good for 
um, seeding meadows because it has compartments that have different sizes, different size holes to let the seed out at different rates. You can imagine because wildflower seed and uh, warm season grass seed are all different sizes, if you had just one size hole opening, all the heavy seed would fall out first and the lighter seed would come out later and you wouldn't have an even distribution of seed. So those boxes in a Truex drill help you to get better seed distribution. What I like the best, and this is great for smaller areas, is to use some sort of organic medium. And uh, we tried mushroom compost and we've tried sawdust and we like sawdust better because it's basically inert. It doesn't have um, any nutrients in it, which you would think nutrients would be a good thing, but they, they promote weeds more than they promote the, the meadow grasses and forbs that you're trying to get established. The mushroom compost was also moister, so it made it a lot harder to spread, whereas the sawdust, when it goes down, is very dry. What happens with this sawdust is that once it rains, it gets moist and it becomes a moist germination medium for the seed. But even more importantly, if you have about a half inch to a one inch layer of sawdust, it will exclude light from hitting the soil and it will dramatically reduce the amount of crabgrass and foxtail that you get in this new meadow. And crabgrass and foxtail are annual grasses that require light to germinate. So if you can exclude the light, those grasses won't germinate and they are really big problems in a young meadow. So by using this sawdust method, you're not eliminating those problems, but you're reducing them quite a bit. So here's the process. You need to have some sort of a hard surface as a parking lot. And we've spread the sawdust out maybe a foot deep and we're spreading the seeds all over this sawdust. Gary Schwetz is out there spreading the seed by hand. And then we take a front end loader and mix all the seed together so that the seed and the sawdust are thoroughly mixed. And then meanwhile, somebody is core aerating the area that is um, destined for the, the sawdust seed mix. So pulling plugs of soil out, which allows the sawdust and the seed to fall in some of the holes. It brings some soil to the surface. So this intensifies the seed soil contact that you get. And then you spread the sawdust over the site. So um, here we're spreading the sawdust about somewhere between a half inch and an inch thick. And this is what this meadow looked like about two weeks after seeding. It was amazing how quickly this grass germinated. Now these plants here um, in the corners were plugs that we added, uh, but the, the grass that you see germinating is what was coming out of that meadow seeding. This is what that site looked like about um, halfway through the summer. You can see there's a butterfly weed blooming, the grass is coming up really nicely, and this is what it looked like the very first fall. This is probably the most successful meadow I've ever been involved with, but um, this is Indian grass. It's starting to bloom, little yellow blooms on the Indian grass. You can see the Rudbeckia, the black-eyed Susan is also still blooming in this meadow. It was incredibly successful using this sawdust technique. So let's talk a little bit about managing the meadow once you have it. And Do that, yes. Where is a reliable place to get um, some sawdust? So Pine View Trucking is the company that we have used. Um, depending on where you, I believe that's um, our Southern Delaware source. So that would be good for this audience. Um, sawmills, you know, if you can find a sawmill, you can get it directly from the sawmill, but we go through the, the middleman. Um, so Sue. This yes. is Tracy. For um, the lower part of Delaware, Eastern Shore Forest Products is a good source of sawdust and they deliver. Great, great. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So, um, so I already mentioned how important mowing a path is. This is also at AstraZeneca. This is a meadow that they just let grow. This is the, what you're seeing now is really flowering of the cool season grasses. Um, but um, what was interesting to me um, is that there were two parking lots here for AstraZeneca, this close parking lot and a further away parking lot. And once they started leaving this meadow and mowing this path, some people actually preferentially parked in the further away parking lot because they enjoyed walking into work through the meadow so much. So it's, it's interesting how different people react to something like having a meadow on their work campus. Now, um, what, you, what is not a meadow is just stopping mowing. So this is, this is a house on Orchard Road in Newark. And I noticed as I was actually running by it one morning that there was this white sign on the door and I went up closer and saw that it was a notice of violation from Newcastle County uh, or from the city of Newark that you know, these people had not been mowing their grass and they were cited for it. So if you just stop mowing and do nothing else, that's not a meadow. That's lack of maintenance. So in order to make a meadow a meadow, you have to have some of these cues of care that indicate to people that you are managing it, that it's purposeful, that it's desirable. And number one on the list is a mowed path. The best way to make a meadow look purposeful and desirable, and plus give people access to it, is to mow a path. Mowing nice, neat edges are also important adding perennials at uh, key places, including artwork and explanatory signs. And I'll show you examples of each one of these. So here's another nice meadow that has the edges mode. So it looks very obviously purposeful. It looks neat and tidy right next to the driveway. And then the rest of the meadow is just a beautiful meadow. Here's an area where they've mowed a meadow and then they've mowed a gathering space and they've put some chairs in here. So it feels very purposeful. It does not seem like, oh, they just forgot to mow this area. Um, here's a meadow at Bloom Technology in Newark um, and they're mowing the edge here. Um, I think this is attractive. Some people might think it looks a little sloppy, but when you see this path that they've mowed through it, and they've mowed a really, really wide path here, um, it looks definitely more purposeful. Here's using um, perennials to enhance the edge and make that look more desirable. Here's uh, the inclusion of artwork. These uh, birdhouses are really kind of artwork in the meadow. Again, making your meadow look like you've done it on purpose. And in public spaces, it might be appropriate to put signs out so people understand why you are, um, you know, not mowing the grass. Um, we had these signs at UD's campus when we started uh, incorporating a number of different components, sustainable landscaping components to that campus. And it was interesting because the ma landscape manager of this area was kind of opposed to some of these things we were doing. He was afraid that people would think he wasn't doing his job of managing the landscape properly. But as soon as the signs went up, he was thrilled because he said, now everybody knows that we're doing this on purpose. Now, this is not a meadow. <laughs> but it is a strip of native plants that are you know, growing together in what some people might consider kind of a sloppy way, but because this nice neatly mowed turf edge has been maintained, this looks much more purposeful and attractive than it would if this landscape were had gone all the way up to the driveway. This is at the Kalmar Nickel site in Wilmington. And so it shows you what the neat edge can really do for an alternative type landscape. 
Um, this is actually a landscape plan from my sister's house. My sister bought a property a couple of years ago that had a somewhat wooded front yard. She took down a number of old trees and made an open space in the center of the yard, in, you know, in front of her house, and she wanted to have a big meadow. And the landscape firm, architecture firm that I suggested she use, designed this landscape. And my sister said, I don't want to have any lawn. I don't want to have a mowed lawn. Why did they put a mowed lawn in? And I said, Janet, you can't just have the meadow going right up to your, your front walkway. It'll, it'll look sloppy. It'll look unattractive. And she said, okay, well, how about if I have the landscape bed and I have the meadow going right up to the landscape bed? I said, no, that's going to, be going to look unattractive too. That lawn provides a very important function in making that transition between the meadow and the landscape bed, the walkway, and the home. And if that lawn weren't there, this would not be a very attractive front yard, but that lawn really makes that transition appropriate. And mowing that edge and keeping that shape of that little lawn makes all the difference in the world. So then how about, you know, what do you do with the meadow um, at, in order to keep it as a meadow? You do have to mow your meadow at least once a year. And we recommend mowing it early in the sp spring or late in the winter, because that allows, first of all, it allows wildlife to enjoy your meadow all winter long. And <clears throat> it allows the weathering of your meadow to kind of beat down those grasses so that they're much easier to mow in the late winter and early spring. I mowed this meadow with my own uh, lawnmower. This is not my home, but I, I, I brought my lawnmower to this site and just, you know, it's a regular old 26 inch lawnmower and mowed down this meadow. And we took the clippings from the meadow and we used them to mulch this reforestation area on this site, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Now, I said you should mow it at least once a year. The second year of this meadow was a really wet, rainy year, and the grasses grew so vigorously that they pretty much obscured the path. And so when you have vigorous growth in a year, it's a good idea to mow your meadow a second time. And that second time should be um, sometime in the middle to the, the last third of June. And what I like to say is mow it at Father's Day, because that kind of gives you, that's the right time. You can easily remember the second mowing of a meadow should be right around Father's Day. So um, what we had to do in this um, year, it was too late by the time the grass had grown and covered the path. We had to go in and actually manually prune that grass away from the path. So the third summer, we did go in and we mowed this lawn with a big mower, um, this meadow with a big mower, um, right around Father's Day. And then this is what it looked like later in the summer. So the paths were maintained. It still had plenty of time for the grasses to grow and flower, other plants to grow and flower. Um, with that uh, June mowing. What you don't want to do is mow a meadow three times. So uh, this is a uh, over 65 a community. Question. Yes. We have, um, given the density of the meadow, do you have to remove the clippings to allow the meadow to come back after the annual cuttings? You do not have to. Um, we did on that one site because we wanted to use them in the forest, but you don't. Um, you can just let the clippings lie there. It's fine. Um, so this was this over 65 community. Um, I was touring with the, with the um, open space committee and we were walking through their paths and they were all excited about their goldenrod blooming in the meadow and they, they thought that it looked really nice. And we got further along and here, the landscape contractor that was managing their site 
who is mowing down the meadow right at the height of the, you know, the most attractive season of a meadow in the mid-Atlantic is the fall and it's getting mowed down. And I said, why? What is going on here? And they said, well, our contract with Newcastle County says the meadow has to be mown three times. And in fact, that is what the contract did say. Fortunately, there was uh, one of the members of this committee is an activist. His name's Dennis Petrelli. And he went to Newcastle County. He said, this is wrong. He had me write a statement. And Newcastle County actually changed their regulations so that these meadow spaces don't need to be mowed three times. They only need to be mowed twice. So individual people can make a difference. All right, we're going to switch gears now. Um, if, if there are any questions about meadows, I'm happy to answer them right now. Um, and then, or we can wait and I can answer them at the end of the talk. Any more burning meadow questions? Haha, <laughs> I don't mean burning the meadow, although that is a strategy for managing it, but it's not a strategy that most people can use because of restrictions on, on open burning. All right, we'll move on then to managing water. So, you know, pre-development before there were homes and other buildings built on the land, when it rained, about 4% of that rain ran off as surface runoff and about 96% infiltrated and went to streams and other bodies of water as base flow. Now, that base flow is important because it gives a chance for the soil to clean the water. When you have surface runoff, there's no opportunity for soil cleansing. And what happens as we start to develop property and we have impervious surfaces like roofs and driveways, now the switch with just this one house in this plot, it's switched from 4% runoff to 38% runoff. So 38% of the rainfall is now no longer getting cleaned by moving through the soil the way it was supposed to. So, you know, what does that mean? At, when you have development at this level, it's not terrible. There's still a lot of land available for infiltration, but when you have development at this level, you now have much less infiltration opportunity and so much of the rainfall is going to run off it's not going to be cleansed it's going to take pollutants with it and that's where you get really significant problems both in flooding and it's interesting this image was um, taken in Hokesson uh, probably, I don't know how long ago now, 10 or 15 years ago, we had a huge flood that took out the Wilmington Western Railroad. Um, and it looks like there's plenty of open space here. You wonder why isn't this water infiltrating better? But it's because there was development sort of uphill from this that caused all of this water to run down this road and cause these, these pretty significant problems. And if we look at this chart, you know, we have these um, stream events that are serious and we have sort of normal little bits of rainfall. So um, this, uh, this line is, this cr is the critical discharge rate that, you know, means that when you go above that line, flooding occurs and you exceed your stormwater capacity, your st you know, stormwater system capacity. So pre-significant development, you have these spiked events, but rarely do they go over the critical discharge rate. But post-development, practically every rain event goes over that critical discharge rate. And that's when we start to get into significant problems. So we get erosion like this. This is the Christina River at Rittenhouse Park, and you can see that this 
um, river is eroding the banks significantly. Here's a culvert, and this culvert is 10 feet wide. So you can imagine this is like 20 feet deep here that has eroded from water rushing out of that culvert. Um, and so these are the kinds of problems that are occurring because we're not allowing the water to filter down into the soil properly. And that water, not only is it a quantity problem, but it's a quality problem because it takes soil and it takes plant debris with it. And the soil and the plant debris both contain nutrients, particularly phosphorus, that then pollutes our surface body of water. And um, what happens then is we get al algal blooms and we have reduced oxygen in the water and we start to have fish kills and unhealthy situations um, because of, of what's in that runoff. And this is just sort of a little, you know, classroom project, but it demonstrates what water looks like when it flows through a vegetated space, when it flows through an area that has uh, compost or, or mulch on it, and what it flows through, what it looks like when it flows through just straight soil. And you can see how clear this water is when you have vegetation that the water is allowed to flow through. So we really need to sort of change our paradigm and stop thinking about collecting water efficiently and thinking more about how do we allow water to percolate into the site. Um, so our early stormwater um, management uh, regulations were definitely based more on water quantity issues than on water quality issues. So detention ponds were the way we managed water, and ponds definitely uh, address peak flows. So you can hold water in a detention pond, and you can remove uh, soluble, you know, total soluble solids is what PSS means, and you can you can you know a detention pond will work well to do those things but it doesn't really work as well on improving water quality. So some problems with detention ponds, um, you can get thermal pollution. If you've got water sitting in a pond in the middle of summer, it gets hot. And then if you have a rain event where water has to flow out of that pond, it, you're getting hot water entering what should be a cool water stream. Um, you can get stream channel degradation when you have, um, you know, high flow periods, especially when you have overlapping storms and you get multiple ponds together. Um, and then probably one of the really important things is that a detention pond takes up valuable land area that's not useful for anything. It's kind of just a big, ugly pond. Uh, so, um, DENREC has put together um, a, a great reference for stormwater best management practices, um, and you can get this easily from the DENREC site. If you Google DENREC stormwater management BMPs, you'll come to this manual. It's available online. And it's exciting to see that a lot of these BMPs are being implemented all over the state. This was uh, Kirkwood Highway's library um, that was renovated probably 10 years ago now. Um, and when during this renovation of the building, a rain garden was put in to manage stormwater. And this is becoming the norm now, managing water by improving infiltration, which I think is really exciting. So bioretention is another word for a rain garden. Um, can be as simple as just a below grade area that's planted um, and it's dug out so that there's a high potential for infiltration or it could be more complicated where it actually has an under drain that can be cleaned out. And depending upon the site, you may have a need for the under drain or not. And all of this is spelled out. These are graphics from that stormwater BMP manual. A bioswale 
is simply a vegetated area that is longitudinal. So it's usually long and narrow and intended to allow water to filter in over that um, the length of the bioswale. A grass channel is simply managing water and allowing it to infiltrate without having uh, additional vegetation in it. So you can have one without check dams, you can have one with check dams. So obviously the check dams are slowing the water flow through that grass channel. Some differences between all of these bioretention type facilities, which is uh, another word for them, a more, you know, a familiar word might be a rain garden, and they're all different types of rain gardens. It allows this natural dosing of water into the groundwater, and usually they're, they're smaller, um, and they're on individual pieces of land versus a detention pond, which is something that is designed to whole water from an entire development or a large parcel of land. And again, this handles water quantity problems, but it doesn't handle water quality problems nearly as well as these vegetated gardens do. So if you look at a rain garden, you know, in somebody's backyard, it's simply a sunken garden. It's about four to six inches below the grade of the surrounding area. Um, that's dug out. It has a flat bottom. That's really important. You don't want to have a V-shaped rain garden because then the water will collect at the bottom of that V. If you have a flat bottom, you have all of that area for the water to infiltrate versus infiltrating just in that small V space. Um, normally, a rain garden is about a third of the size of the area that you are trying to drain to it. So if you were to calculate your roof, your driveway, all of your impervious surface, you want a rain garden to be one third of the size of all of that impervious surface. We usually think of rain gardens as being kind of informal landscapes, but they could be formal or informal, it's really totally up to you. This is a large rain garden that was built at Flint Hill, which is a, a large uh, preserve um, in Newcastle County. This ag field has, it is sloped. There was a lot of runoff and they wanted to slow the water down. So they made this area and then on the other side of the driveway, they made this area. And then this is all before the planting. It was planted so that um, the, the plants would actually function to slow the flow of water. Here's we a, have much a quick question. Sure. If we want to add buffer zones around our retention ponds, do we need to get DENREC or anyone to approve it? We currently mow to the water's edge. Um, I honestly don't know the regulations from DENREC, but it would be, I can't imagine that it, I mean, it's far superior not to mow to the edge of, of a detention pond. It's the much better to have the edge vegetated. So I, think, I would think, and I don't know if there's anybody on the call that uh, works for DENREC or, or knows the regulations, but I would think it would be much, much, it is much, much better to plant the edge. Yeah, is, is Jessica on here? I don't think I saw her. No, I don't think she is. Hey, Blake, I'm yes. off here. Can you, go, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so the buffers are not regulatory. Um, they're recommended. It's a recommended best management practice. Um, but we've talked a lot about this in our stormwater maintenance workshops. It's, it's always kind of a battle in communities whether to have the buffer or not have them. It's just something, it's not regulated, but just encouraged. So, so the question was, do they have to get permission from DENREC? And it sounds like no, if they, if DENREC is encouraging a buffer and a community wants to put a buffer in, they should definitely do that. That's, that's correct. Okay. So here's a very different approach. It's a small rain garden. This um, homeowner augured some holes in the, the land. This was a 
very clayey soil and they wanted to get better infiltration. So they augered these holes. They filled the holes with sand to really encourage good drainage. And then they just planted a garden on top of that. And um, it, it doesn't look any different than any other garden might look, but it's functioning to allow much better infiltration than that, than that site used to have. One of the things that people tend to think of when they think of rain gardens is they think, oh, I have this wet area at the lowest point of my property, I should put a rain garden there. And that's actually incorrect <laughs> because the point of a rain garden is infiltration. So if you've got an area that's draining poorly, that's not going to infiltrate well. <laughs> so you want to put your rain garden really upslope from the area that's draining poorly and try to get the infiltration before the water gets to that low water logged area of the property. Now, I have to admit, this is not a rain garden, but it could be. There's nothing about this. If this area had been dug out, say four to six inches deeper, a good infiltration medium put in, and then this formal landscape planted on top of it, you can see it slopes down from the left, and then it slopes further down to the house. This would actually be a perfect place to have a rain garden and let the water filter in through this formal grassy area. And I just include this slide because I want to emphasize that rain gardens don't have to be informal and naturalistic all the time. This could function perfectly as a rain garden if it had been built as one. Here's a rain garden at UD's campus. Um, it's it's pulling the water off of this uh, driveway and parking lot and allowing it into, to filter into this traffic island. We had a quick question here. Yes. So what should they do about the low, uh, the low areas that are waterlogged? Well, if you can stop the water from getting to that low area by putting in a rain garden before that area, that's the best way to deal with it. Now, if, if you don't have a property that's configured in a way to allow you to do that, you can improve the drainage of that low area by doing something like what that homeowner did with augering holes. So you can dig out that area and improve the drainage of that low area. But the better solution would be to stop the water before it gets to that low area by having your rain garden upslope from, from that low area. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so planting, these are some of the specifications that DENREC includes in their um, stormwater management guide. Rain gardens should have 75% uh, native plants you can have 25% exotic species, but they should not be overly aggressive or, and definitely not invasive species. You should have a ground cover of herbaceous plants. And initially, the rain garden should have bark mulch because you want to try to reduce the weed competition. You want to hold, hold moisture for those plants to get started. Ultimately, you shouldn't need to re-mulch a rain garden because the plants should completely grow together. Um, a few other things, if you're going to have trees in your rain garden, you need to have at least four feet of soil depth. If snow melt is expected, you want to think about using salt tolerant species. And one of the kind of ironic things about a rain garden is you really need to have plants that are both water tolerant and drought tolerant because we live in a mesic environment where it's wet sometimes and it's dry other times. And so rain gardens are gonna be very wet in the spring and sometimes in the fall. And if we have a dry summer, they're gonna completely dry out in the middle of the summer. Fortunately, there are a number of plant species that tolerate both of those extremes. Red maple that's pictured on this slide is a good example of one 
that does. And you want to use various sizes and ages of plants to make it look more naturalistic. So this is kind of a problem. The trees are in the center of the rain garden, which is where most of the water is going to collect. It makes much more sense to put trees a little bit up the slope of the rain garden. It's not very far. Here's the lowest point of the rain garden in this median here uh, along Highway 1 um, in South Bethany. And then the Sweet Bay Magnolias are located just up the slope a little bit. And that makes a lot more sense as far as planting trees because most woody plants do not tolerate standing water very well. One exception is buttonbush or cephalanthus. It's one of the few woody plants I know that will tolerate standing water. So it's a very useful plant for a rain garden. But in general, there are a lot of herbaceous plants that do tolerate standing water, like our native hibiscus. This solved a roadside problem where lawnmowers were getting stuck. This used to be an area that was mowed along I-95, and we planted this uh, hibiscus or marshmallow, and it completely solved the problem. So here, here is a group planning a rain garden. This was installed near the Newcastle County Cooperative Extension Office on UD's campus. And one of the things they've put in is an early successional ground cover. This is a, an annual grass that's been seeded in between all these plugs to kind of hold the ground and stabilize the soil until the plants had an opportunity to grow and completely fill in. What you don't want is to have a rain garden that looks like this, where you have big open spaces because those big open spaces that were mulched are now becoming full of weeds. And that is what makes a rain garden or a bioretention facility look so unattractive. So you really need to think about filling that space up with plants. Um, you also need to think about sort of the aesthetics of the, the garden itself and no disrespect meant engineers, but clearly an engineer and not a landscape architect designed this rain garden because nowhere does a rectangle look naturalistic. This rain garden looks a lot more attractive in just sort of this, you know, narrow median in um, South Bethany. So here's a rain garden at the University of Delaware campus. It's, it's on the new Star campus and it's a highly designed rain garden. So there are big sweeps of individual species, which it's very attractive, um, even in the winter when this slide was taken, but, um, it does mean that anytime you get a weed in this area of grass, you're going to notice it. And if you have a plant that dies or doesn't do well, you're going to end up with a big open patch that's problematic. As opposed to this kind of a plant, and this is the native uh, garden in uh, Lewis at the Britain Center. And if a weed comes into this garden, no one can tell <laughs> because it's just a big, you know, mass of lots of different plants. It's a different aesthetic, but I think it's also an attractive aesthetic that's a lot easier to manage than managing something like this. While this is beautiful, it requires a lot more maintenance. So you need to think about, you know, what kind of maintenance budget you have and, and you know, how you're going to manage the rain garden. This is what question. turned out to be really, yeah. Uh, what happens when a homeowner has their sump pump drained to a rain garden with a high salt content from their water softener, Brian? Like are you seeing salt injury on any of these rain gardens? I am, I personally have not seen salt injury, but you certainly could. In that case, I would think it would be very important to choose salt tolerant species, which we definitely have. Things like bayberries, um, switchgrass, a lot of the, you know, uh, baccarus, things that grow right along the coast are going to be salt tolerant. And those would be species that I would use in that type of a rain garden. 
So this project was done by the Central Inland Bay so a number of years ago, the Sea Colony. Um, and um, these ditches were very narrow. And so water was leaving these ditches and going right to the inland bays very quickly without having any chance to infiltrate. And so in an effort to keep clean that water and give it more time to infiltrate after an event, there was um, both an engineering and a plant solution that was imposed on this site. So the, the ditches were made wider, which was the first step to allow more time to infiltrate. And then plants were added to also slow down the water. Now Sea Colony, who was very cooperative and participated in this project, was also very concerned about making sure the entrance to their facility looked attractive and that people good about you know, their condos and, and thought that you know, people are you know, buying these condos and renting these condos to have a good time at the beach and they didn't want the area to look unattractive. So what we did was we went in, we planted a lot of native plants. We had this no mow zone on the road side. So there was a mowed area and then a non mowed area that was taller grass that allowed, you know, for more slowing of the water as it moved through that taller grass zone. And then these plants were planted on either side of this widened ditch. This is what it looked like about two years after the installation and water was um, slowed down. It was taken up by these plants so that um, the water, by the time it got to the inland bays, there was less quantity and it was a higher quality water. And the other thing that happened that was really interesting is that people loved this landscape. It looks much more like the beach than the landscape that was originally on the site. You know, that is boring to my eyes and a lot of people's eyes, whereas this is attractive. And so Sea Colony turned out to be very pleased with the result of this project. And, and all the people that I talked to really said they loved this new landscape treatment. So we're going to move on now to a third type of landscape that you might have as opposed to having a, um, a mowed lawn. Uh, and that's a forest. And I find very few people who are opposed to forests. Like everyone loves the woods, but people think, well, a forest is something that is, is long-term. Like I can't have a forest in my lifetime in this new area that I'm trying to manage. In fact, this is a little forest fragment that was at the corner of what used to be maintained as a golf course on UD's uh, campus by the College of Ag. And Gary Smith, who used to be a landscape architecture professor at UD, got permission to allow this to go through the stages of succession. So they stopped mowing. This picture was taken about 15 years after the mowing was stopped. What's significant is that Gary didn't plant anything in this forest. All he did was remove invasive exotics that came in. So all the trees that you see here, sweet gums, red maples, black gums, all of those came in on their own. They were planted by squirrels or birds or wind. Um, the only thing that was planted is a little bit later on, this, um, there's my cursor, this uh, wood aster was added on either side of this path um, to sort of make definition for the path. Um, but, and these hostas were obviously planted at the edge, but all of the shrubs and the trees in this little forest fragment were, were planted and free by nature. So, and I'm not saying that there wasn't maintenance involved because they did have to remove invasive exotics during this 15 year period. But 15 years is really not that long to, you know, get a forest. And if you think about suburban development, if neighbors could collaborate 
have the lawn space that they need for play area and entertainment and circulation and let the rest of their land go to something else, in this case forest, you would start to be able to put those forest fragments together and make a more substantial corridor for the environment than um, if just one person does it. Um, going back to that original landscape, this is a, a grove in the center of the front yard of this house that is a forest fragment. It's not that large, but it's got trees and shrubs and ground cover. It's a great place to rake the leaves into, and it becomes sort of this mini forest in this home's front yard. This was the project that I've been showing you. Um, it was in Applecross, the Applecross development in the Greenville area of Northern Delaware. And this was the forest fragment component. So you can see there's a forest behind the fence. There's a stream at the back of that wooded area. And so we just wanted to extend the forest up into this backyard. We planted some trees and shrubs to get it started. Um, uh, this is what it looked like the second year. You've got uh, lobelia, um, cardinal flower blooming. One of the and one of the ways that we managed this differently from just a regular landscape bed was we did not weed it other than remove invasive exotics. We kind of just let the plants duke it out, um, and as the trees grew, it became more and more of a forest and an extension of the woods behind it. And you can see it's all filled with plants and it doesn't have that look of a managed landscape bed. It does look more like the forest is coming out uh, into this backyard. We have questions. With forest, yes. So will native trees eventually crowd out Bradford pears? We are having to manage them annually and we are three years into transition from mode to forested. Uh, I don't know the answer to that because the calorie pear problem has not been around long enough for us to see what happens. But I would say um, in any open space that has calorie pears, at this point, I would recommend removing them and stump treating them. Um, I think it's going to be, it would be a long time before native trees were able to outcompete them, even if they can. So I would recommend removal of those calorie pairs. So Sue, one of the questions that was a little earlier was mowing at a six inch height. Yes, that- um, Or will that control the Bradford pear? Well, yes, mowing at a six inch height would control, like if you're maintaining a meadow, that will control woody plants all woody right. plants. So yes, that, that, that those two mowings a year will keep woody plants out of a meadow. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. So just like a meadow, it's important to have paths through a forest because again, that provides you access, it looks purposeful, it encourages people to wander through it. This is at the UDBG, this is the Lepidoptera Trail, promoting um, uh, butterfly and moss and skippers. And um, this, there's, they use pine straw mulch to define this path, making it inviting to walk along the trail. Here's that same grove that I was showing you before in the, the front lawn of a home landscape. And this illustrates how great that grove is for raking leaves into. So instead of collecting leaves, you can just rake them right into this little forest grove and you get natural nutrient cycling occurring, which is definitely a desirable thing in the landscape. So when you have a forest, it is definitely true that you need to manage for invasives. We've had a couple of questions about that. This is a forested area and it's covered with multiflora rose, bittersweet, all kinds of undesirable invasive species that should be managed ideally. 
This was a project that we did at Ashland. Um, it's a company that took over the Hercules site, it used to be the Hercules golf course and, um, and Hercules um, uh, company. And they had this area that was choked with invasives. We went in and um, used this big mowing machine to mow down the invasives. Now, once you do that, you haven't completely killed them. <laughs> So their, their roots are still there. So you have to do two things. One, you have to be ready to treat with an herbicide, any re-sprouts, and you have to seed or, and or plant something else desirable in that area that will help outcompete the invasive. So we, we seeded um, um, uh, low fescue grass, we planted a bunch of other trees and shrubs, we put a wood chip path through this area in, and we saved the desirable native trees and shrubs. And so um, what used to be a completely choked out wooded, you know, small wooded lot or space has now become an attractive and desirable space. But again, it will take management, as some of you have already pointed out. I want to finish this talk by talking a little bit more about managing nutrients specifically. Um, this is a beautiful landscape in the fall, and it's an attractive small lawn area. And we can tell it's fall because of the asters blooming and the colors of the trees. And this is the time that a lawn should be fertilized. That's why I've in included this. A lot of people think, oh, spring, it's time to fertilize my lawn. That is actually not the best time to fertilize the lawn. Lawns should be fertilized in the fall. So if we look at fertilization a little bit, uh, plants need 16 essential nutrients. Um, the first three, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, are supplied by the air. The next three, the primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, are usually what we apply in fertilizer. And then the secondary nutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, are usually present in high enough quantities, but a soil test will tell you whether or not you need any of those elements. And then the micronutrients, the rest of the uh, essential nutrients for plant growth are really present in the soil. So long as the pH is at the proper level, you don't need to add these micronutrients. Um, the nutrients are absorbed by plant roots, ooh, lost the T there, from, from the soil solution. And that's the process for getting those nutrients into the plants. Uh, some important nutrient management uh, points you need to soil test before you fertilize. It will tell you the pH. So that tells you whether micronutrients are going to be available. If you've got too low of a pH, you might have some nutrients present in toxic quantities. If you have too high of a pH, you might have some nutrients that are bound up like iron. Um, iron is present in the soil, but if your pH is above eight, you will not have iron available to the plants. Um, soil tests will also tell you how much phosphorus, how much potassium, how much magnesium and calcium are in the soil. And so you can determine whether you need to add more or whether you should avoid adding some of those nutrients when you're managing your landscape. It's a good idea to use slow release fertilizer or at least a percentage of slow release because it allows the fertilizer to be released at the quantity that the plant can take it up. It's very important to calibrate your spreaders so that you know that you're applying the right amount of fertilizer. Um, and it's important to fertilize grass at the appropriate time. So cool season grass, which is what we primarily grow in Delaware, should be fertilized in the fall Warm season grass, which are grasses that are grown, um, that grow best in the summer, they go dormant in the winter, zoysia is an example, Bermuda grass is an example, those should be actually fertilized in, in late spring because they do most of their growth during the summer months. Couple more things, it's important to sweep up fertilizer that's spilled. Fertilizer spill like this is prime for polluting surface water. 
So if fertilizer gets spilled, you need to clean it up. You don't want to fertilize within 25 feet of a shoreline. Again, that's going to pollute that surface water. You need to clean up after pets. We're doing everything we can not to encourage ducks and geese. Um, they're hard to manage. It's hard to get rid of them. Although uh, one of the best ways to get rid of ducks and geese is to have a meadow because they won't land in a meadow. They will only land where the grass is mowed. So if you have geese and duck problems in an area of open space, making it a meadow is a great way to solve that problem. Uh, keeping uh, storm gutters and drains clear of leaves and composting yard uh, trimmings to keep them out of waterways are other important nutrient management strategies. I want to make the point that the University of Delaware soil testing program is open during this difficult time, um, but there is a special address. They're taking soil samples um, through a PO box because the university mail service is not operating. And if you go on the soil testing website, if you just Google University of Delaware soil testing, you'll get to their website and they give very specific instructions on how to take a soil sample and how to mail it to them now while university mail is not operating in its normal way. So just a little bit more about fertilizer. One of the things that I find when I talk to lots of homeowners, um, at people in general, is that there's this feeling that synthetic is bad and organic is good. Everything organic must be good for the environment and everything synthetic must be bad for the environment. And when it comes to fertilizer, that is not really the case. It's much more about fertilizer solubility. So quick release means that fertilizer or in particular nitrogen, which is negatively charged, so it's not held into the negatively charged soil particles, which is why when we soil test, we don't tell you how much nitrogen is in the soil because it changes so rapidly. Um, so um, a quick release fertilizer will have the nitrogen immediately available, right ready for quick response by the plant. It's inexpensive, but if you apply too much of it, more than what the plant can take up, it's going to run off and you're going to, to pollute water. Slow release, on the other hand, is released over a slow period of time. There are different mechanisms for release. It could be that it's the degradation of the particle. It could be microorganisms working on the, on the particle releasing. Um, lots of different ways that the nitrogen is released. It's good for long-term maintenance. It will never burn a plant or the grass, and it's much, much less likely to leach. So the difference is really between quick release and slow release, and there are times when quick Quick release is perfectly appropriate um, so long as you, you know, know that the plant can take up all of the fertilizer that you've applied. Now, there are synthetic quick release products. There are synthetic slow release products. There are organic quick release products. Believe me, uh, fresh poultry manure is quick release fertilizer, whereas um, composted cow manure is slow release fertilizer. So it's much more important to think in terms of quick release, slow release than it is to think in terms of organic and synthetic. Um, I, I see that we're getting close to running out of time. I wanna quickly just make a couple of other points. Um, I said fall was the best time for fertilizing lawn. If you look at how grass grows, it makes sense. In the spring, you have all this vigorous top growth. So fertilizing in the spring will simply make you have to cut the grass more frequently. Then the grass often goes dormant in the summer. It comes out of dormancy with the fall rains and it starts to grow roots and tillers. And that's the kind of uh, growth we wanna promote. So it makes sense to fertilize at that time of year. And I just wanna wrap up by showing you some landscapes where institutions, large public spaces, 
are managing their landscapes a little bit differently than we always have. So it's getting away from that first slide that I showed you that had that neat and tidy landscape. This is a friend's school near Baltimore, and they are really priding themselves on having lots of native plants and having plants that are managed in a looser, more open style and getting people to see that that can be quite beautiful and, and in you know, a, an attractive way to manage plants. The more public spaces that have plants managed in this way, the more people will see that it's okay to manage their individual home landscapes that way. This is the High Line in New York City. Um, this is before it was uh, renovated to become the park that it is today. It is one of the most visited uh, public gardens in the entire world. Um, this was kind of the inspiration. Uh, this is an elevated rail line in New York City. If you haven't visited the High Line, I highly recommend it. It's gorgeous. And it was, the landscaping was designed, at least the herbaceous plants, by Pete Udolph, a Dutch landscape designer. And he took his inspiration from the plants that had just populated the High Line. And when it was renovated and made open to the public, it has a very different style of landscape from many gardens. Longwood Gardens uh, opened a meadow area about five years ago, and it has become the most visited part of Longwood which is, it is quite beautiful. And, you know, Longwood having this big, gorgeous meadow that people can wander through has made a lot of people appreciate meadows more. This is a meadow in Southern Delaware at the Delaware Botanic Garden. It was also designed by Pete Udolph, which was quite a coup for Southern Delaware to get a Pete Udolph uh, garden, uh, meadow garden. And uh, it's being managed by lots of really um, active and wonderful volunteers. And if you haven't been to the Delaware Botanic Garden, I highly recommend that you go. It's, it's beautiful, not now, but soon when you can visit this garden again. And then individual homeowners are starting to realize that they can take land out of areas that were originally mowed and make a meadow. This was a couple um, in the Middletown area that had heard me talk about meadows. They asked me to give them advice on how to get a meadow in their front yard and they sent me this photograph of their meadow the first year and how thrilled they were with it. Other communities have talked about doing something different with their open space. I went out to this um, development in um, near Newark and they had this kind of wet area and I suggested, why are you mowing this whole area? Why don't you make this all a meadow and then simply mow a path through the trees and back out again? Nobody really used this area. It was a maintenance hassle. And I said, I bet if you made that a meadow and mowed a path through it, many more people would actually use that space and enjoy it. Um, I don't have an after slide because they haven't done that because there's still a lot of resistance to the idea of meadows. So we have a ways to go before people will really accept the concept of meadows. But on, on the positive note, this is um, a retirement community um, up near Kennett Square. And this area of meadow and the, the homes that look out onto this meadow are the most expensive homes in this retirement community because everyone wants to look out onto the meadow. There are a lot of bird houses in this area and um, it's, it is the most desirable location in this community because of this large meadow area. So there are a lot of bright spots in this um, whole you know, transition to a different kind of landscape. This was a project that John Kazan, a master's student at the University of Delaware did, looking at meadows as pollinators. And of course, this is a very floriferous meadow. This would not be a kind of meadow that would be able to be maintained in an open space. He actually weeded this meadow by hand, but he learned a lot about which pollinators visit 
which plants, and uh, we are going to be writing a fact sheet based on his research that we will hopefully have available this fall. So I just wanted to end with this beautiful shot of um, a natural meadow in Delaware on the roadside, um, covered with little blue stem. And I really think we should, you know, we should be focusing on celebrating the beauty of our state in a, in a natural way wherever we can. So I'll end with that, and I'll certainly stay on the, the call for a while. If people have additional questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. So one question someone had was, if you're doing a meadow, it, do you have an increase in mosquitoes and ticks? Or is that a concern that you've heard from others? Uh, it is definitely a concern that people have. I don't see why you would have an increase in mosquitoes. Um, mosquitoes are present in standing water, um, uh, but it is possible that I, you wouldn't ha necessarily have an increase in the number of ticks that are present but you might be bringing them closer to where people are, which is why it's very important to mow a path through a meadow. Um, so if you've got a wide enough path mowed through your meadow, you should not be at risk of contacting ticks any more than, than you would if you're walking in, in your lawn. And I also popped in there, because I know you and I've had this conversation before about, um, when you're using paths, it's important to continue to use the paths as cues of care to show that you are maintaining an area and you're not just walking away from it. But can it be an issue on private land when people just stop and think that it's a park? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you're really concerned about that, you could put a sign up at your path that says private property, don't enter. Um, you know, uh, or you could say, you know what, if somebody wants to walk through my meadow, walking through a path is the best way to maintain a path. So, you know, like I don't mind if people walk on my property, like if they want to enjoy my landscape, great, that's wonderful. I mean, if you don't want people to enjoy your landscape, then, you know, yeah, put a, put a fence or put a sign that says, uh, you know, private property, please you know, respect, respect this path and, you know, don't use it. <laughs> That's, and that would you and I solution. talked a little bit about maybe mowing a path, but not really showing where the exit and entrance is. Yes. It'd be an issue. Exactly. Right. And Brian has uh, his hand raised. Brian, you want to? Uh, yes. Hey, I just came in late because I did realize it was on, but uh, we live in a community called Independence, which amounts of open space. And I've always said, boy, wouldn't it be nice to not keep cutting that and wasting the money? And are, are there any type of papers or how to or reason why uh, information that we could bring to our uh, HOA committees to maybe start them thinking about turning some of these very big expansive areas into these, you know, meadow walking path kind of uh, environments you know, for lots of different reasons and i think one of them even uh, just because we're so big at just wiping everything out in these developments trees and everything are just being totally bulldozed and then then we plant grass and fertilize and cut it and um, if there was something i could bring like a paper or a resource i could go to it might help uh, me bring some justification to the uh, process so so I would recommend we have a publication that's available on the UD Cooperative Extension website under sustainable landscapes. It's called Livable Ecosystems, a model for suburbia. And it talks about all of these different types of ecosystems that I've mentioned, rain gardens, meadows, forests. It's a little bit of a how-to as well as the benefits. So that would be a printed resource. Um, also, Tracy said that she is recording this program. And I used a lot of images that 
you know, give the benefits of meadows, how to manage meadows. And so once you got your home owners association to start thinking about this, you could have an, an evening or an afternoon or whenever uh, where you played this um, recording and get other people who didn't, weren't on the call to learn from this, this program. And the website was? The website is UD, a cooperative extension, and then you have to click on sustainable landscapes. Is that .org or .com? It's Brian, dot if, you, if you actually type into Google UD Lawn and Garden, it'll, it should pop up on the top and, and you'll see that there's a, a button on there called sustainable landscapes. Very good. The other thing that I'll also mention is that we have a demo site here um, at the Carvel Research and Education Center where the Sussex Extension Office is. I don't know how much programming we're going to be able to do, but I have several volunteers who have helped us maintain different types of um, demonstrations with meadows, different ways of doing it to show the um, um, progression. You know, sometimes you'll buy a mix and it's, as Sue mentioned, you're not going to be able to maintain all those beautiful um, flowers, you know, it will change over time. And so we do have some people that you may be able to talk to, um, or maybe they'd be willing to come give a presentation to your group as well to just talk about our experiences. A question in the chat box. Do I need to plant anything particular for a meadow or can I just let it go, cut it twice? I worry my, neighbor, my neighbors will have issues with this. So what I tell people is try it. Like it's, it's easy to just stop mowing, cut it twice a year and see what comes in. If you don't like what comes in, if it doesn't look attractive to you after a couple of years, then you can easily just mow it back down. Uh, and then you have to go to, you know, more of an intervention where you actually kill the existing vegetation and either seed or plug desirable species. But you won't know what your meadow is going to look like um, until you try it. It really totally depends on the soil conditions, the surrounding seed sources, the you know, amount of weed seeds that are existing in the soil that you have. All of those things will dramatically impact what a meadow looks like. So I recommend people try it at first. And if you don't like it, mow it back down and then you have to use a, a more intensive type of intervention to establish your meadow. What height should they cut also, it? I'm they sorry. They should they should cut the they should cut it to about six inches. Uh, you can cut it shorter than that with your winter cut, but the summer cut should be cut to about a height of six inches. So one of the things I will mention when we did our meadow demo, we have an area where we literally just quit mowing. I did put an ornamental um, piece out there to, to um, make it more attractive. We did do a section where we did um, a seed mix and use the sawdust method. This is a small area, so we actually mixed in a wheelbarrow <laughs> and then put it out there, but it was interesting. We cut the demo plot in half where I let certain volunteers put out what they think. And then I went back in and covered the back half with more sawdust to that half inch inch depth that you talked about and then better germination. I have to put a caveat in there that it was a year in 18 where we had so much rain that we had to um, plant at like the last possible date <laughs> for warm grasses, but it did come up and look great. Good. Yeah, so you can see what what different strategies uh, of meadow establishment, what the results, at least on that site, will be. One of the exactly. issues is that every site is different. So it's, you know, nature is unpredictable. <laughs> so you do have to sort of try things at your own site. Do we have any other questions? Comments, suggestions? 
Um, Tracy, can you give uh, folks an update on where you're, you're going to put uh, make this available? Yeah, we will um, edit the um, recording. We'll put it. We'll also we'll put it out on our UD site, and then we'll also share it with the Soil Conservation District. Um, for those who have not been with us to on the February 20th date where we had presentations, all those PowerPoints are actually on the Sussex County Soil Conservation District website, and so we'll do that as well, so that you know we have. Um, this information available to people. If you are on for nutrient management credits, um, there was a link that was shared with you in that mailing um, email and please fill that out. You will be getting 1.5 credits for attendance today. Um, and um, Blake just put up our survey to help us better um, provide the information that you're looking for for your specific location and, and group please fill out the survey in the chat box. And um, you know, if you have any other questions, please feel to, uh, free to jump in and we appreciate everyone joining us today and um, hanging in there with the internet connection. Um, John has a- uh, Everybody's on at once. <laughs> yeah, and I think John has, a, has an announcement or a comment. Perfect. Yeah, I just wanna have a, a, I just wanted to comment a little bit about this, uh, this topic. So uh, in the past, golf courses typically have a lot of areas to mow, and I, I want to kind of relate this back to, to, the, to the, the native area meadows that we're talking about. But in the past, what worked really well for large open spaces that uh, golf courses did not want to mow in the past, a good mixture was fine fescues mixed with some wildflowers and the only downside to that, it, it turned out really well for the first several years. Uh, the, the, the weedy species kind of stayed pretty low, but depending on your site, it's always going to be different, like Sue said. Uh, but the, the only thing I think, or the downside to, to what I saw was after an extended amount of years, maybe five to seven years, the the weedy trees, kind of like in the picture that we see right now, you see to the right there, you have some some weed trees. It, it just, they, they started to come up and it just depends on what you feel is acceptable for your meadow. If you're fine with having some of these trees start to pop up in your meadow, then then that's okay. But uh, if not, then, then, then mowing, uh, like Sue said, a couple times a year would be really important to, to keep those trees back. Thank you. Anybody else have any other questions or anything? Well, thank you all so much. Um, I just put in the chat box, Don Emerson is a new agent with us with Delaware Cooperative Extension and is a great resource for us, especially in the area of turf and nutrient management. So we want to thank him for jumping in. And a special thank you to Sue for all her time and efforts to pull this together. It's great information. And I know, um, this can help us, especially for those of us in Sussex. Um, there's a lot of open space there, or those wet areas that I think we could change over time. So again, feel free to reach out to any of us in extension if you have questions. And we appreciate everybody's time today. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon and stay safe and healthy out there. Thanks everyone. Thank, Take care. thank you. Thank you, Sue. Take care everyone. All right, bye-bye.